All right. Well, thanks. <clears throat> well, I'm an extension economist here at K State. I kind of mainly do farm management issues, and uh, you know, part of the idea with farm management, I'm also doing the ag finance, and that involves looking at the prices of oil and the prices of fertilizer, and those things have certainly come to the forefront as of right now. So I'm going to give you my try to give you my best outlook on this from an unbiased perspective. You know, there's certainly a lot of political implications in all this. I'll try to you know stay out of those weeds if I can and just give you my impression of what's happening now and how that's going to affect, especially how it affects prices for farmers going forward right now. <clears throat> well, as you might know, you know, we're in a very topsy-turvy world right now. Um, it's almost like you have taken a can of soda or maybe taken a, a snow globe and shaken it up. We're still in that kind of shook up phase. So things are still kind of jumping back and forth. Um, and you've seen that just happen today. I think I just got a, a text message from the Wall Street Journal saying that oil prices were down. Uh, 6% today, where they had just been up quite a bit over the past week here. So we're still on that, what I would call trying to find our equilibrium yet. The market is still trying to figure out where it needs to be. And I think that's going to kind of continue for the next couple of weeks or so, where we try to fight, figure out exactly where prices should be for oil and fertilizer. So that's kind of the prelude going into this. Um, and as you might know, um, Uh, the current situation, we have seen quite a jump up in prices here the last week. So here is a graph of what the weekly uh, highway uh, gasoline and diesel prices have been for the last year. It starts January of uh, 2021, and it goes to the current time the last week. I think I just updated this yesterday, so it should be fairly current from the uh, EIA uh, source of data. Uh, you know, gas right now, we're at record highs. We're at $4.20 a gallon, which is never has been in that ter territory, at least from a nominal price. Uh, just in this last year, you know, in the last two and a half months, gas has already been up 24% this year. You know, normally you don't think of that kind of increases happening over a several year period. Diesel's been up even more, 34% for the entire year. And for those of you who have filled up gas today versus what it was last week, you probably saw a big jump in that too. So gas has been up 50 cents a gallon just in the last week. Diesel is up 75 cents. So, you know, just tremendous price increases. Again, I don't, I don't know if these are going to end up where prices are going to end up, but we're still certainly in that uh, where markets trying to figure out where prices need to be here. So expect to see this kind of jump up and down for the next several weeks. Now, that being said, we can't blame all the price increases just on the Russian Ukraine conflict because 2021 saw some really big increases as well here. The whole year was pretty much a time of increases. If you follow this graph across, you can see there's various points in time where it has gone up quicker than others, but very few points during 2021 where fuel prices actually went down. So over 2021 itself, gasoline was up 45%, diesel up 30%. Now, as an economist, you know, at the very end here, we don't like to see prices go vertical like this. That's never really a good thing here. So it makes things a lot more hard to predict and it adds a lot of uncertainty. I guess it keeps us in a job because we have something to uh, try to estimate from. But again, you know, vertical increases like you're seeing right now for the last couple of weeks, is not something we really like to see happening in the market. But what's the current situation for oil? <clears throat> Well, again, uh, again, uh, another year of big increases. Uh, again, a lot more in the last week than there than there was previously. But again, uh, even in the last year, prices pretty much doubled. We pretty much started the year of 2021 with oil prices right around $50 per barrel. And uh, just yesterday, when I was looking at this, we were uh, the futures price for West, West Texas Intermediate was almost 120 per barrel. It's just a $24 increase just in the last week here. So we're seeing uh, high prices right now. Again, this has come down again today. I'm not quite sure where this is gonna settle here and whether markets have fully priced uh, this invasion, Russian, Ukraine conflict fully into their pricing yet, but certainly they priced a good chunk of it, I think, already into their, their prices that we're seeing. All right, well, how do, how do prices look at more from a, a longer term historical perspective? And here's highway gasoline price highway diesel price. And what I have done basically is I have taken the nominal price, which is the price you actually paid at that date. And then this dotted line is the price if I would convert it back to current dollars here. So I'm calling that my real value here. So again, that's factoring in the inflation using the CPI index. So you can see, you know, we had uh, about seven years here where gas was really pretty low in price. It was right around 
the two to three dollar range, even when you look at that on a real perspective, you know, that's still probably below three dollars most of the time here. So, you know, consumers in the U.S. have gotten used to gas being fairly reasonably priced. Now, if you go back further, you'll see some periods where gasoline price was a lot higher, especially when you look at that on a real term. So we had this period from 2011 to about 2014, where really on a real dollar basis, gas was really above four dollars, kind of like you're seeing now. And if you go back even further back here to about 2008, you actually see at one point gas was really in real dollar terms about five dollars per gallon. Now, there was a consequence of gas getting up to five dollars per gallon because those of you guys who keep track of recessions know that we had a pretty severe recession happen in 2008 here. And the same thing happened on the uh, uh, agricultural side. We saw commodities drop quite a bit here. So this recession was a cure for high gasoline prices. It was also a cure for some higher um, uh, corn and soybean prices as well here. But we did see gas drop off quite a bit. Again, it rose back again here in this period. But again, this period here, nice level gas prices that consumers got used to. Now we're seeing a big rise. And again, this is this was based on the first of the year here. So now we're looking at you know gas prices here above four dollars here. So we're, we're we're approaching new territory and certainly on a on an actual nominal price, this four dollar twenty cent that I just showed you for the gasoline price, that would be a record price for for gas here in the US. And same thing on the diesel, you probably see even places where diesel was actually about six dollars per gallon for a highway diesel price. So again, there have been some periods of, of high fuel prices in the past. Well, what's the situation now looking at in the US? Well, here's a, here's a graph of uh, what oil exports have looked like. So say what you will about fracking, it has done wonderful things as far as the amount of oil that we have to actually import into the US, which is good because for a while there we were very dependent upon foreign oil. That, that percent has gone down quite a bit, which I'll show you here. In a, in a few other graphs, but you can see we're actually now a net, well, no, we're not, not actually not a net exporter, but we do export quite a bit of oil. You can see um, well over 100,000, or yeah, 100,000, uh, excuse me, 100 million barrels per month. So it's quite a bit of oil that we're actually exporting. Again, a lot of that oil that we're exporting is our lighter oil that we're getting from the fracking process, lighter, sweeter oil. Um, but we still import those. So what, what's the import situation look like? And this is where I think a lot of people get confused because they see this number that says we actually export quite a bit of oil and they, and they think we're actually a net exporter of oil. That's really not the case though, because if you look at the import side of the situation, we still import quite a bit of oil. And the question you probably jumps to your mind, first of all, is how can we export so much oil while we're at the same time that we're actually importing a bunch of oil here too? And uh, the difference goes back to uh, really a couple of different things going on here. The first is oil is not all created equal. So think about wheat production. There's, there's different varieties of wheat. You know, here in Kansas, we do hard red winter wheat. Back where I grew up in Southern Illinois, we do soft, um, uh, soft red winter, or yeah, soft red winter wheat. And there's also white wheats involved too. So all wheat is not the same. Well, it's the same thing with the oil side here as well. So oil can either be classified according to its viscosity, whether it's a, a you know, thick flowing versus more of a, a liquid flowing, water type flowing type product. And it's also described by it either being sweet or sour by based on the amount of sulfur that's actually in the oil. So, you know, the oil that we're getting out now from the ground through fracking is really a lighter, sweeter oil, which is valued very highly in other parts of the world because it's a much easier oil to refine, uh, refine to get gasoline from it. It doesn't take, you can use more of a simpler distillation process to get gasoline from. Now our refineries here in the US really are set up to uh, process more of a heavier oil. They have, they have a lot more hydrocarbons, which is really kind of a good thing because typically those heavier oils um, are cheaper in price than the lighter oils. And they also, since they do contain more hydrocarbons, you have to do a much more complicated process to actually refine those, but it gives us a lot of products, byproducts that come from a barrel of oil, like all your greases and, and lubricants and things like that we can get from those heavier uh, hydrocarbon uh, oils that we that we used to typically uh, oil drill for here in the US. And that's really when we talk about building the Keystone Pipeline for Canada, we were looking to bring more of those heavier oils back in the US because really our refinery system in the, in the US is actually set up to handle that kind of, kind of thing. I mean, we could probably refine 
the lighter oils, but again, it's not in our best interest to do that. There's other countries that have the simpler distillation processes. Uh, they can process that stuff easier. So it makes a lot of sense from a trade perspective for us to export those lighter weight oils to countries that want that. And then for us to take on the heavier weight oils and actually process those and get a lot of the byproducts. We, we use a lot of byproducts from the oils here in the US as well here. So that's the reason why you see a country like the US not only do we export a lot, but we also import a lot too here. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Trade has been good from that perspective. Hey, Greg, we've got a yes. question that might be relevant just to answer right now. Uh, can you provide a few examples of byproducts of heavy oil again? Well, it's like, you know, like your greases uh, that you use for lubrication and, and that kind of stuff. Basically, anything that would say a petroleum product, which probably comes from a, a, high, a more heavily mo molecule oil that has more hydrocarbons in it. So you get those kind of things you wouldn't typically get from these lighter oils, which is probably more, they, they, more, most of that product would end up as gasoline. Whereas we get, you know, still get a good chunk of gasoline from the heavier oils, but we do get a lot of the other greases and lubricants that we need and all the things we do here in the US. All right, the other thing about um, uh, importing and exporting oil is the location of where the oil actually is needed it's here. So, you know, think of the US and think, okay, that's US is a homogeneous area you know, where the oil is, that's where we need it. That's really not the case for a country like the U.S. where it's so big here. If you look at this little map here, I'm not sure how well this shows up on PowerPoint. But anyway, these, these red dots are petroleum refineries. And again, these are mostly, these are going to be set around in, in the Midwest and Plains area, like you see here, and also especially along the, the Gulf Coast here. And this is where most of our oil comes from, where most of it is processed. But as you guys well know, most of the oil needed for fuel is not needed here in, in the southern U.S. and in the Midwest. It's needed on the coast here. So you get over here and suddenly now you got to figure out a way to get oil over to these parts, either by pipeline or by trucking. You notice here there's a, several refineries here in California as well here. I'm, I, I'm not for sure about this, but I imagine most of these California refineries are probably taking in oil that they're being imported and bringing in and refining directly here. So again, it makes sense from a trade perspective is to, you know, shift a lot of our lighter weight oils here out of the Midwest through the Gulf and then bring oil that we might need into the coast and from different places. So trade, trade is a good thing and it makes a lot of sense as far as moving oils around. Uh, these green lines are, uh, our blue lines are where we ship a lot of refined products and the green lines are would be our crude oil pipelines here. So we do move oil quite a, quite a bit over land, although it can be rather expensive, you know, certainly, Pipelines would be the cheapest way to go, but we do quite a bit of, you know, truck traffic and also rail traffic moving oil around here. You know, the United States is a big country and we need to get oil and gas and diesel to it really to all parts of the country. And then the final factor would be the quantity. So if you look at, you know, we're bringing oil in, but really when you look at the amount of uh, diesel fuel and gasoline that we're actually producing, we're probably actually uh, just a little bit maybe of a net exporter for those finished products. Uh, that was the case a couple of years ago. It may have dropped off a little bit, but um, we are able to produce at least a lot of our uh, diesel fuel and gasoline domestically that we use here without having to bring those in. It's, it's these byproducts that we're probably needing the extra oil for. All right, well, let's look at a graph here of looking at exactly what has happened with production and net imports over time. So luckily the EIA has enough information for me to go through and looking at where I can look at countries of the US and, and get a net import export number here. So you can kind of see what happened in the US over time. And um, I went back to really to about 1970 for the start time because this would and kind of include the area where we had the 1970 oil crisis, you know, we had gas lines and you, you guys old enough to remember all those good things that happened. We had become a big, uh, reliance on imported oil during that time, as you can see, this, this reddish area for net imports had grown quite a bit here. Well, then we kind of had a mid-crisis here and that dropped down. But then notice what happened from about the mid-80s through about 2007 here. Our, our domestic production numbers started to go down quite a bit. It was looking like we were going to run out of oil, maybe. You know, there were people talking about that. We would uh, never have enough oil here in the U.S. and we would eventually run dry. Our, our total oil usage was still going up, as you can see by the top of this line here, which meant we would become very reliant on foreign oil here. So that, that was not a good situation happening right around 207. And then um, we kind of had a situation where we discovered fracking and how to make good use of that. 
where basically we're able to drill oil wells horizontally under the ground and get oil that we never really have been able to get out of the ground before here. And that has really been a boon as far as production in the US here. So look at where we went from 207 to where we were now. You know, we have more than doubled our oil production here in the US, but we have become to a point now where we are actually the world's leader as far as oil production. And, and notice what has happened to this gap here between production and total use, the net imports, that, that percent has gone way, way down. You can kind of see what the effects of COVID happened in, in 2020 right here. You know, basically when we were, were supposed to stay home to flatten the curve for two weeks, you know, oil usage really just dropped off the cliff here because of that here. So the, the amount that we were actually importing dropped way, way off. And we were just about neutral as far as production versus uh, importing things. But then the economy started kind of start to grow again, as you can see right here, kind of a classic V-shaped recovery. But you'll notice here, we can't, we quite haven't matched up production to back what it was before here. So we uh, during this time here when COVID happened, we kind of shut down a lot of our um, a lot of our fracking wells because they weren't too profitable at that point in time, put them in mothballs basically. We have restarted some of that, as you can see right here, but we're still at a point where we're still below of what we were producing before here. So um, I'm thinking with the prices right now, we may see some of this get uh, restarted back again, to maybe at least get back up to here. And that doesn't mean we can't go beyond this either here, but I think this should probably be our goal is maybe to get back what we were before. Well, if you put all this together and look at what, what percent of our oil actually comes from foreign sources, here's a graph that kind of illustrates that here. So you can see during the kind of the gasoline crisis during the 70s, we were about almost up to 50%. This is what kind of when OPEC ruled the roost and we were very dependent upon what they were doing over in the Middle East that dropped back down. But then again, we became very reliant on foreign oil again, where it was almost 70% of our total oil usage. Now notice what happened with fracking. Now we got down to the point here in about 2018 where we were about almost about 15% of our oil was only 15% was foreign oil. Again, that has backed up a little bit. So now we're right about right about 20% here. But you know, I think we have the potential to take this even lower if we really need to. So even though you know we still use quite a bit of foreign oil in the US, that percent has dropped way, way off, which gives me a lot more confidence of. You know, we can meet crises like this Russian Ukraine conflict and, and not really have to worry so much about how much oil we're getting from Russia because that it's not near as big a percent as what it used to be. Well, what's the, what's the current world situation like? Again, we are still very reliant on foreign oil. I don't think that's ever going to go away totally, but it's certainly a, a big improvement over certainly what it has been over the last 15 years where we go from 70 percent of oil use to east down to uh, potentially under 20. But again, even 20% for a big country like the US is still a lot of oil coming into the country. But where do most of our oil imports come from? Well, we're still getting about 15% from OPEC countries. And again, that number is way, way lower than what it used to be. Uh, but again, you can see where a lot of our foreign oil does come from. It comes from Canada. It's that heavier oil that Canada produces that, that our refineries here in the US are, are really set up to handle pretty well here. So it doesn't have to come too far to get to us. We get 7.5% from Mexico, and then we get 1.5% from Russia. So even though we're really kind of insulated directly from the effects, if, if we do try to shut Russian oil off, I mean, it's not a direct influence, but that's certainly going to affect oil prices because you know oil is a fungible commodity. It's, it's easily substituted from one place to another here. So uh, the fact that we cut Russia oil off just kind of raises prices off, but again, it's not, not so much directly affecting us as it is some other countries. Uh, looking at production uh, of, of uh, oil and also other liquids. So uh, this graph basically shows that we're the leader producer of uh, petroleum products, but this also includes a lot of things like when they get, when they do fracking, they get this uh, uh, liquefied natural gas out of, the, out of that process. So this bumps us up a lot higher than what the crude oil number actually is. If you took that off, we'd be down to about uh, 11 million barrels as opposed to the 18, but we're still leading uh, producer of oil here in the U.S. And these circles here on the graph, the world map shows you which leading countries are. The bigger the circle, the more oil that is produced. Uh, Saudi Arabia is number two, which probably isn't surprising to a lot of folks. But again, I don't know if a lot of people really realize how big an oil producer Russia, Russia actually is. They are number three 
in the world. In fact, they're, they're, they were probably, I would have to get, imagine, would eventually catch up with Saudi Arabia, Arabia. They certainly have made a lot of progress in getting up to where they are now here. So again, Russia is certainly one of the world's leader as far as producing oil in the world. Uh, let's, now let's look at uh, countries actually exporting oil. And as you might imagine, uh, the Middle East is certainly one of the leading areas for doing that. Uh, we see, if you go over here and look at the list on the right, the countries that are exporting oil, a lot of those are Middle Eastern countries. But again, not only is Russia the second largest producer, they are also the second largest exporter of oil in the world. Uh, when you look at the total amount of exports, Russia amounts to about 12% uh, of that here. So, you know, the world is very dependent upon Russian oil. Uh, they, they are basically exporting about 5.2 million barrels a day here. So uh, you, again, you can't cut uh, exports off from Russia without expecting there to be some influence on the price by doing that kind of thing. Hey, Greg, we've got a question we might as well just take. It's relevant right here. Um, the comment, I read a number that 8 to 10 percent of our imports are from Russia instead of 1.5 percent, as you detailed. Is that crude oil versus finished product? What is the distinction? Um, I think I'm just looking at the uh, amount of crude oil. So I, again, I got I got all my numbers from the Energy Information Administration, which you know should be our our top line uh, reference for looking at these kind of things here. So again, I, if you saw a number like um, eight to ten, that could maybe be some other finished products, but we're not really getting that much finished products as far as you know gas and stuff. From other countries here so i'm, I'm not sure what you had to show me where that number came from for me to be able to to give you some more detail about that and we had another one how much of russia's increased production is attributed to the bp and other foreign investments that are rolled into the sanctions and foreign direct investment walking away do we anticipate that the the production capacity dropping in russia yeah, I'm sure BP and others foreign investment has certainly helped on on the production side. Um, and again, I know if you know if they went away, and I'm not sure how Russia could do it on its own, how well I'm sure they could to some degree. Uh, you know, we kind of saw similar things happen in Venezuela when uh, when we were kind of forced out of there here. But again, uh, that's probably waiting in the areas that I'm probably not best qualified to answer. But I imagine even without BP's help, Russia can still produce quite a bit of oil. Although you'll certainly you know, we, we probably had the best expertise here in the United States as far as producing oil here. So whenever our exp expertise goes away, I, I think that's going to hurt other countries too here. But I still expect even without any uh, outside involvement from other countries that Russia could still produce quite a bit of oil. And Dan just dropped a link in uh, from the EIA. So that should okay. be helpful. All right. Um, let's see, so I just did the export side, uh, consumption side of things. Again, you know, we're, as you might imagine, we're the world's leader as far as consumption per barrels per day. Uh, China is number two, though, now. Uh, they have been catching up quickly here. You know, I, I imagine some point in the future that China will actually consume more barrels of oil per day than us. And this, this doesn't include uh, just imports. This is total consumption here. So eventually, I expect China to actually pass us and we'll, we'll become number two. But right now, we're, we're still number one. Everyone else kind of compels in comparison to China and the United States here. So Russia, you know, Russia still consumes quite a bit on their own, but again, they produce way more than they're consuming here. So that makes them a net exporter when it comes to uh, oil production. Um, leading countries for importing oil. So as you might imagine, you know, China with, with uh, as we just saw there for consumption, they're also the leading country as far as the amount of oil that's available on the on the export market, they, they actually use over 20% of that just themselves here. So they're bringing in 9.2 million barrels per day to meet that. We're also a big user of foreign oil, as you can see right here. Uh, we're still um, the number two importer. We use about 13% of the export market just for us. So we're, we're using about 5.7 million barrels per day. And remember, Russia is exporting 5.2 million. So really, I mean, what Russia produces all by itself, we use more than that ourselves here in the U.S. Now, we're not obviously not getting all that from Russia, but just to give you an idea of perspective, what Russia produces versus versus how much we're actually using. OK, let's switch over to nat natural gas then, because, again, this is another important uh, energy product, especially when you look at fertilizer production, because natural gas, where natural gas comes from, 
is going to be key to determining um, where our nitrogen fertilizer comes from. So again, uh, dry natural gas, I, again, I learned a lot of stuff by researching this over the last two weeks. Dry natural gas is really more of the finished product for natural gas. I guess they call it wet natural gas when you first get it out of the ground. You know, it has a bunch of other things in it other than just natural gas. It has methane and some other like water vapor and that kind of stuff in it. So this is more of the finished product for natural gas. I can see as far as production, you know, we're, we're still number one again in this area. But again, right, again, notice Russia is number two. They, they're, they're not too far behind us, maybe a third behind. But again, we dwarf all the other countries as far as the production of natural gas. What about exporting natural gas? Well, ru again, Russia, they don't use near all the natural gas that they're producing here. So they export nearly a fourth of the world's export market. It just is from Russia itself. 8.5 trillion cubic feet is from them. Uh, again, we produce the most, but we also use the most. So um, uh, we we actually, I think I'll show you here in a second where we stand in all this. So we're not we're not really a, a big country as far as exporting or importing natural gas. We're almost kind of neutral as far as that's concerned. What about consumption? Again, you can see uh, you know we dwarf everyone else as far as our consumption of natural gas. Uh, we're using uh, 31 trillion cubic feet. Uh, yeah, 31 trillion cubic feet. Uh, I think this is on a per year basis, so which is more than twice what Russia is using. They're the, they're the second biggest country. You know, China is using quite a bit here as well. And if you look at who's actually importing uh, natural gas, so again, China, they're they're the biggest uh, importer for natural gas. They use about 13% of the total, total export market out there. Here's what's a little concerning to me, though. You know, natural gas is not one of the easiest products to move around the world. Um, you can certainly do it through pipeline, but if you have to go through other methods, and especially if you want to ship natural gas overseas, I think it can be done if you liquefy it, but it's certainly not the easiest thing to do here. So, you know, the pipeline system to get natural gas around is very important, especially when you get over to Europe. For this very reason right here, because look at the countries who are having to rely on imports as far as for natural gas gets is concerned. It's most of Europe, really. Uh, Germany, Italy, and France, United Kingdom. I just put these down because these are four big countries that are big users of natural gas. Russia, really, if you look at their needs for uh, these four countries here, their needs for natural gas, Russia exports enough really to meet almost all four of these countries. It would be about really about three and a half of these countries. So Europe is really very dependent upon natural gas. You know, that's what kind of where the pipeline system is set up over there. Uh, that's, that's the area I kind of worry about is I think markets will solve the pricing issue, but uh, I, I, you know, prices could really spike for natural gas, especially during the winter time in Europe, just to make sure they get enough, enough gas over there. So that, that's, that's a little bit concerning situation for them. Now we're not quite so uh, much of a, a, a worried about for us because we do get a lot of our natural gas either domestically and we also can get, get some from, from Canada as well. Well, where are oil prices headed? Um, Again, this is a very volatile situation. So uh, I last updated my slides uh, yesterday about noontime. So here's here was the situation then. Brent crude, which comes from the North Sea, was at 126. West Texas Intermediate was at 122. And uh, again, they, I think prices were down a little bit today. So it's you know it's kind of looked like it's shaking out somewhere right around the one 125 area for prices it doesn't mean it couldn't go higher but the markets are still kind of trying to figure that out so expect to see prices jump up and down quite a bit over the next few weeks so this assuming this is kind of where we are the think the first question you need to ask is are prices fully priced have they fully priced the russian ukraine conflict into prices and i guess i would argue that i think we've priced a lot of that already into prices the fact that they were down a little bit makes think the market thinks they may have overreact a little bit too much over the last couple of days and they kind of back that off a little bit here. So I think a good chunk of that's probably already in the market. That doesn't mean prices won't go higher. Um, you know, I would not be a bit surprised if oil prices got up, you know, to the 150 range. I would not be shocked by that at all. But um, uh, certainly I think a good chunk of that's already baked in. You know, prices are certainly, they've already baked $25 or more into the price already here. So uh, I think some of the, the Ukraine conflict is, is in prices that we're seeing right now. Next question I think you need to ask is um, about looking at 
can we actually keep Russian oil off the market? So, you know, oil is a fungible commodity. So, you know, it's very substitutable. You can take, you know, uh, Canadian oil and our oil and put them in a pot and you couldn't tell which oil was which because it's gonna all look the same. Well, the same thing with Russia oil. I mean, can we effectively keep Russia oil off the market here? I mean, we can say we're not gonna buy Russian oil directly. That's fine. But I mean, are there backdoor ways for Russian oil to make it to the market? If you look at the, um, and I already thought about various scenarios for this. So, you know, uh, China and Russia actually share about 6,000 miles of border, I think. I mean, it doesn't look like much on the map because you got, uh, you know, a big country in between there. But on, on the ends, they, they do share some border here. And we know Russia is already one of the world's biggest importers of oil here. So, I mean, what would prevent Russia from shipping a bunch of oil to China since they are connected? And that would reduce the amount of oil that China has to buy because they're already having to import quite a bit. If China quits buying oil from other places, that just makes that other world oil available to other places. So I have a hard time believing that we can effectively keep Russian oil off the market. Now, the effect is when we cut off the direct connections between these countries, you know, if we, if we don't buy the Russian oil directly here, that means it has to go a roundabout way to get to the US, it's just gonna make things more expensive. But again, I have a hard time thinking that we can be totally effective doing this unless we get every country in the world involved with sanctions here. Again, that's just kind of my, my opinion about, about sanctions. But when you're talking about, you know, things like a fungible commodity like oil and gas and even fertilizers, it, it's hard to say that we're actually gonna specify Russian oil specifically and say that will actually never ever, oops, no, never ever make it to, um, to the market. All right, let me go back where I was here. I know where I was. All right, and then I have a third question. This is more of a hypothetical situation, but, and I thought about this too in relation to some other things, but does Russia really need to sell oil? Now think about this from a historical perspective. Russia has always been kind of a self-sufficient country until you know, the last couple of decades or so. When they when they kind of discovered world trade now certainly world trade has been good to them as well but i'm reminded from a line from the matrix reloaded where the, where the architect is talking for those of you guys familiar with the matrix and he, he's talking about the machines taking over the world and the quote from the architect was there are levels of survival we are prepared to accept however the relevant issue is whether or not you're ready to accept the responsibility for the death of every human being in the world meaning that you know the machines in the matrix movie were willing to accept the fact that you know it may, it may not be an optimal for them to uh, have things the way they were but they were willing to go at a lower level if, if, if it got them what they were trying to accomplish well you can look at that from russia's perspective too i mean how, how badly do they want ukraine how much are they willing to accept are they willing to accept a lower standard of living because really, you know, they, they produce enough oil and, and gas for their own needs that they probably grow enough agriculture for their own needs as well here. Can they get by in a lower standard of living? And I, I don't know. That's a question I think we need to ask. And I haven't seen too many people asking this very question. The news is, you know, what, what are they willing to accept for this uh, to, to make this Ukraine thing happen here? So I think, I think people need to give that a thought as well here, because certainly imposing sanctions has a cost to us as well. I mean, uh, I, I look at your, uh, Europe and their needs for natural gas. They're going to pay much higher prices for natural gas in order to stay warm. And, it's, and we're not, we're not going to be immune from the price increases as well, too. So we need to all keep that in mind when we think about these things. Um, uh, give me a perspective where the EIA thinks we may be going. I, I think EIA may be a bit optimistic about where they think prices are going. This is from their March uh, short-term forecast, this blue line. It's what their forecast number is. So they're, they're right about the right point that when this thing came out and they're actually predicting prices kind of to decline over the next year. And here would be two years out where they would get oil back to $80 per barrel. Now, if that actually happened in two years from now, I would be very, very happy as economists. I think that'd be wonderful things if we got oil back down to that, that level. I don't, I don't really see us getting that to that low level for oil. Now, you notice here they bracketed this with what the New York Mercantile Exchange has for their price confidence interval and they're basically showing a range anywhere from a down here to about forty dollars per barrel up to about 180 here I, I think this lower level here i don't think we'll ever get down to forty dollars per barrel oil again here so i would almost look eighty dollars if i had to ask my perspective i would say eighty dollars is probably our bottom line number 
I would say probably more than 150 to 160 would be our top line number here. So, and uh, I really expect oil to kind of stay at a, at least above $100 here going forward, even if things kind of do settle down with Russia and Ukraine. Again, just kind of my perspective here, just looking at this uh, directly. Um, well, how does all this oil transfer back into uh, the price for fuel? So this is based on weekly data from the EIA looking at the weekly oil price and the weekly gas and diesel price. And I developed a regression line that shows you what this is. And the regression line is very, very strong. Uh, it's well over 90% regression. So as you can see, you know, uh, gasoline price is affected less, the blue line, than what the diesel price is. It tends to go up just a little bit faster. And, it, <coughs> excuse me. and if we're at $100 per air barrel price for oil, which is where we are now, that would put us probably in the, you know, mid of uh, about 4 to 15 to 420 range, which is about where we are right now. So the model is working pretty well. And that would put uh, diesel fuel right at about uh, about 475 or so. All right, so that's that's where we are now. Assuming let's say oil goes up to actually 150, which again I don't think is unreasonable, but that would be more toward the top end of my forecast for that. I'm going to have to expand my my graph to actually incorporate that. But again, if we got to 150 oil, that would put gasoline here probably five dollars per gallon. That would probably put diesel fuel probably getting close to about 550 to $6 per gallon here. So keep that in mind going forward that if we do see 150 oil, expect to see very, very higher prices for fuel, which would probably add what, at least another, we're at 420 now, would add another 80 cents, 75 to 80 cents per gallon if oil got up to 150. Okay, what does this do for farmers? Well, just looking at our Northeast corn budget, which is probably going to be one of our more expensive budgets here, and again, we've had to revise our budgets um, a couple of times over this last year just because things have changed so much. But as of early January, when I redid these last time, I think I had about 150 uh, anhydrous in there about that point in time. We were looking at total expenses of about 627 per acre. That includes both uh, direct and fixed costs. That works out to be about 433 per bushel. Uh, I think I had at that point in time, I had diesel, farm diesel price at 295. Uh, uh, diesel, the fuel cost is only 963. Again, bigger equipment, uh, more uh, no-till conservation till, don't require so many trips across the field anymore. So about $10 in total fuel cost. Um, assuming diesel goes up in price, we're looking at a, maybe a 430 farm price for diesel fuel. That would actually add $6 per acre. And that, again, that's just since the first of the year here. So. It may appear, you know, the fuel cost isn't affected that much, but again, this is a direct effect. What's going to happen is you, when I get to the fertilizer side, fertilizer prices are going to jump a lot, which is affected by oil prices. So not only is the direct diesel fuel cost going to go up, but we're seeing the, uh, the higher prices for fertilizer that you're going to see in my next section for this. Okay, and uh, here we go. All right, so uh, questions about this. I think I'm about right on time, Rich, for where I need to be. Yeah, you're in good shape there. Uh, we've got a few. Do you want to just look at the chat yourself, or shall I read them to you? I want you to read them to me. Okay, uh, we have one. Why is the USA's oil consumption so much higher per capita than all other countries? And Dan answered a little bit, but I'll let you to have your take on it, too. Okay, well, it's mainly because we produce so many things, and we are such a big economy, so we have a lot more people... Uh, driving and going places, you know, we're a big country. So when you go to you make your trip down to Florida for spring break, which a lot of our college students will be doing here in a few days, you know, that, that's a, uh, that has quite a bit in gasoline costs where if, you know, if you're in Europe, you take, uh, you take the train, countries are most more closely spaced together here. So that's part of it. And again, we do a lot of things that use oil here. So not only do we have agriculture, you know, we're using a lot of our natural gas to make fertilizer. It's just, we're such a big economy. We, we, we use a lot more fuel than other, other countries do. And there was a comment about the uh, WTI crude today is presently 110 with a low of 103.63. So yeah, so they down. dropped down today. I, I would not be a bit surprised if we saw oil up maybe another, you know, the go up 10% tomorrow here. That would that would not surprise me the least. I expect that to happen with, we're kind of, like I said, we're kind of in the mode of shaking up the soda can. We're waiting for things to kind of settle down here. So we're kind of at that stage right now. Uh, Given U current U.S. production, how long will our reserves allow the U.S. to remain the number one producer and a nearly neutral importer? 
I really think for a long time, because I don't think we have fully tapped into all the potential out there for fracking here. So again, you see various estimates for that here, but I think we have the potential if we actually, you know, take advantage of, the, of our fracking technology and using it to, to be the world's leader exporter and producer for oil for a long, long time. And here's just a comment regarding China and Russia. China is a tough negotiator and pays less per barrel than what Russia is used to getting on the open market. So the oil could go there, but it would hurt total revenues compared to past marketplace. Next. Um, oh, go ahead. I, I was, I, I'm not sure I fully agree with that because, you know, oil is kind of a competitive market here. So I'm not really sure how much you can negotiate as far as oil like that. It's like selling soybeans. I mean, are you really going to be able to, to negotiate a higher price for the elevator for your soybeans? I don't really think it quite works that way. Now, it could be the case though in Russia. I mean, if China suddenly is the only buyer for Russia oil, well, yeah, maybe that might be a factor that could that could come into play. But in a normal situation, and again, we certainly aren't normal, I, I would not expect China really to get a better price in oil than anybody else. Will landowners start getting offers from oil companies to lease land for exploration? Oh, um, well, it depends on how badly we as a country want to uh, get the rest of the oil out of the ground, I guess would be the question for that. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I think they've already identified where a lot of these oil are. So if you're not if you're not over one of these uh, shale locations in the country, it's not, and again, that's not over the entire U.S., that's only certain areas here. So um, they're probably going to explore those routes first before they look at other areas. So I, I would say if you haven't already got a, a phone call from a, or at least someone who thinks there's oil under your property, you may not be getting anything in the near future, but uh, certainly those areas where they know there's oil, the other, I think we're going to see probably some ramp up at least back in uh, tapping our shale reserves that we've, we've kind of taken offline over the last couple of years. Would allowing E15 year round make a noticeable dent in the price at the pump? Oh, good question. Uh, Dan, this might be a good question for Dan, actually, um, because I think he, as he'll talk about on Friday, you know, you know, with the uh, amount of exports going on, I mean, do we want actually want to go to an E15 type land here? Because that would just take more of our more of corn things going on. So um, I don't know. That, that, that's I, I think I would save that question for Dan. Um, this is Dan. Uh, and I, I took a first shot at it. Uh, you know, with full, if, with full adoption and acceptance by consumers and gas lead stations um, and under duress, maybe we'd get a pretty quick adoption. But under uh, um, so far, we've had a slowness of just acceptance of some of these changes. Uh, just a, a lot of a uh, lot of uh, communications to be undone, I guess, from the past with regard to engine damage and all that stuff. So any, anyway, uh, um, I, I think it if, if adopted immediately and fully accepted. Yeah, it would probably help. And ethanol prices have been running about 250 and gasoline prices running higher. So um, it could help. Uh, but again, it's the slowness of acceptance that, that we, that's been an issue so far. Okay, next question. Uh, I've been reading a lot about the Jones Act from the 1900s and how that contributes to part of our need for importing Russian oil. This has been waived in the past due to hurricanes. Do you see any appetite for waiving this again to allow us to ship oil from Texas to the coasts and particularly Hawaii as opposed to relying on foreign oil? Oh, this is again, not really my area of expertise. So if anybody else wants to handle that. What I have read about that though is when they've explored that, the U.S. really hasn't, they haven't really been too enthused about wanting to do that for whatever reason here. So uh, as anybody, I, I'll, I'll let someone else answer that question. They want to handle that. Uh, just as a thought, Greg, to, to try to chime in on it. If, if I understand the question right, the, uh, you know, it, it depends how high and severe prices are. You know, we're willing to take more risks. And to make investments like that, that again, if they were deemed risky because of weather issues before, maybe with new, maybe with new technologies and uh, new drilling techniques that would, you know, that uh, that are horizontal, uh, we, we might we might be able to get out into some of those areas. But I, I don't have a strong answer on it. But I, but uh, again, I I think we'd be more willing to try a riskier situation if we have extremely high prices. Here's a comment on those uh, oil leases. Several landowners I'm aware of have been approached by oil companies to reopen leases that have been closed earlier this decade to utilize fracking technology. 
and go back in and try and get more oil out of the ground. Our farm will reopen some ground this month. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I would totally expect that with higher oil prices right now. I'm sure oil companies are getting a little more enthused about you know cranking up their fracking places where they've been in the past. Mm -hmm. And one final question here, unless something else comes in. About 30 years ago, we had an oil issue and we stopped having daylight savings and it saved a lot of oil. Might we do this again? Well, you know, they have expanded the daylight savings times when they are either in now. So I, what, it's in another week or two, I think we start daylight savings time, don't we? So yeah, it's this yeah, Sunday. I guess actually. I could save a little bit, I guess. I don't, I don't know if it's going to make that big a deal is my first thought about that. 